Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is American Issues, take one. Uh, we are joined by Louise Ng, an esteemed guest today. We're so happy to have her. Uh, and Chuck Crumpton, our regular contributor here on American, can I say that, Chuck? Our regular contributor on American Issues. And today we're going to talk about the Democratic Party and its platform. You know, fact is that um, there just doesn't seem to be all that much energy. Uh, Trump always has the floor. If you look at the newspapers, if you look at the media in general, what are they talking about? They're talking about Trump. And there's so little that they say about the Democratic Party, the Democratic candidates. It's of concern because, in fact, you know, people are affected when all the oxygen goes to Trump. Uh, so let me uh, let me start with you, Louise, if I may. Um, is there enough energy in the Democratic Party to win in 2024? Well, and let me just preface this by saying that uh, thank you for inviting me onto the show. And I just want to let you know I'm not a political commentator. I am a political watcher of events and very concerned as a voting citizen. So that's where I'm coming from. And um, I have, you know, I have hopes that the Democratic Party will find its voice and energy and the, uh, you know, the focus that it, and excitement that it had back when Obama was running or even the early days of the Clinton campaign. I still feel like they're trying to find their, you know, what is going to motivate Americans and, and bring us together. So I, I'm hoping and I'm I'm watching and we better get something done quickly. Yeah, maybe a lot. Chuck, a lot. How, how do you feel about it? Is the Democratic Party giving us the kind of um, leadership, the kind of energy uh, that wins elections? You know, I was going to respond to the question to Louise the same way I responded. I don't know. I don't know what they're offering. We know what Joe Biden is reported to say about the economy and Bidenomics and stuff like that. But what we don't know is what are they bringing to the table that offers us better choices and better consequences? And there, it seems to me there is so much that is should be said, can be said. Um, what you know, the uh, what the economic revitalization package has done. Um, the focus on just, you know, let's save democracy in America against autocracy and, and you know, just rigid regional interests and, and the like. There's so many issues that we can be addressing. I also feel like the media is being lazy. They just take the, you know, the story that, and that sells the news. They go with Trump. It takes, as you say, the oxygen out of the air. Let's focus on um you know what is in what people should be what people are concerned about and what the democratic party is doing has done positively to help lives you know i see a, the the um the great stories being told among commentators like um was it professor uh, the one who does the american letters um professor richardson who i think is yeah. so articulate but we need the press to be connecting the dots too. Is it is it that Chuck? Is it connecting the dots, or is it just coming up with whatever matches uh, what's going on on the Republican side? I mean, you know, it troubles me that the Republicans that do name calling, they do bizarre things, they don't really have a platform, uh, and the Democrats are, you know, they're Fauntleroy. They're just going down the same track they've gone down before. And if you look at their platform, it's very long and there's a lot of shibboleth words in there. But, you know, there's no excitement. And if you if you are having a reality show, you need to match reality with reality, even if one side is not real. You know, it, that's a really important perception, Jay, because neither party is really giving us anything new that they haven't given us back in 2020 and 2022. Why would that change things? No. I think people seem to be really tired of Trump and going on and his minions and his competitors going on the common enemy theory of 
the woke, the liberals, the non-whites, the uh, the other. Okay? And for Democrats, yeah, their common enemy is Trump and the rest of his group. But they need to offer us something more than that. They need to offer us a direction. They need to offer us components. They need to offer us this is the word that Obama emphasized, change. Enough already. Well, we're kind of at an inflection point, a very dangerous one. This is an emergency, okay? And I looked through the website of the um, you know state and national democratic uh, parties, and I looked through their platforms. I, 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 my, I had eye strain very early in the game. And um, and I uh, uh, concluded um, that um, it was boring. I'm sorry, we've heard it, as you say. And the Republicans, uh, you know, they're they're interested in attacking the Democrats. So it's not boring. It's an attack. It's uh, it's insults and it's uh, whining and it's all the things that Trump does. And so, but they have a platform. It's not as long. Um, it's probably more pithy if you read it. But the bottom line, though, is that this is not a time when we can make judgments on the basis of written platforms. One, um, because the Republicans lie. I really you know, feel that that is synonymous with Republican these days. And two is because the Democrats are just going down the old road and it's kind of boring in the face of all the lying and the insults. So if you want to look for their platforms, the written platforms aren't that helpful. Um, you have to make your own decision about who's telling the truth and who's got the, I hate to use this term, the energy to actually move the country forward at a time of inflection, at a time of emergency. I did not see any statement of emergency in either the state or the federal democratic platforms. There's no state of urgency there. Um, Louise, your thoughts about how we evaluate them? Well, for one thing, I'm not sure how many people actually go look at the platform. You, um, I thank you. I actually read it. I read the 2021 for the first time, Jay, when you sent it to me. And, you know, a lot of the values and um, principles there did resonate with me being a, you know, someone who was a good Democrat. But um I guess in terms of delivery and communication, we can't rely on that, right? It's sort of, it's kind of old school way of communicating. Um, I do believe we have, the Democrats do have an opportunity here though, to be giving a positive message and show how they are moving forward because the, the Republicans are so busy with attacks and lies and sort of straying from their principles that we have an opportunity to swoop in there. And on the one hand, you know, in terms of Biden and not being an attractive candidate, um, you know, I I feel like, okay, we need to be looking at successors and building up our successors um, of leadership in the Democratic Party. And at the same time, you know, if Biden feels he can do the job and, you know, he should just face that age issue head on and just say, who's, you know, like 80, 80 is the new 60 or 70. Um, I can do it. So I feel like there's an element of positivity and energy that needs to be injected into the message that the Democrats are um, sending. You know, we had to get to this, Chuck. The question is whether Biden has the energy to win an election. Right? He's fighting with people who are, you know, who, he's fighting with Trump, who is a very nasty man, uh, who is, you know, got psychological problems we all know about. Um, but who is an entertainer, you know, it's the reality show and he's still doing it. Um, Joe Biden is a nice guy, but nice guys don't win horse races. And um, the conversation seems to be getting louder and louder that maybe he should, maybe he should throw his hat out of the ring. Maybe he should uh, give it up to a younger, a younger ticket. Um, and, you know, I, I feel that he should really consider that. But I also feel that time is going by and we are almost in 2024. If he's going to do that, he's got to do it right away. 
put his arm around the shoulder of a younger candidate uh, and pass the baton. Your thoughts? You know, I, that's a great question, Jay. And one of the things that we can see in history is hey, charisma is a really, really important element. And it's been make or break for the best of the Democratic presidential candidates. Clinton had elements of it that worked really well for him and probably helped make the difference for him. Obama certainly has. Right now, unfortunately, neither party has anyone with the kind of charisma that really reaches out to people and says, you know, I, I think I can sort of trust this person in leadership. We have no one that really inspires that level of confidence. And polls are, are close to worthless. But if there's anything that they do indicate, that level of dissatisfaction in leadership is very high for both parties. Well, um, yes, but Trump is popular. He's popular in the base. And uh, to the extent uh, that uh, Joe Biden is um, sort of soft soap, um, he's relatively popular. So I worry about that. The comparison seems to be growing more and more stark. Trump's special recipe seems to be working. And I, I for one, am worried um, about all these indictments and whether he can somehow escape them. Uh, he's a, an old pro on uh, escaping the court process and escaping even judgments. But but Louise, you know, what worries me is that um, we have 330 million people in this country. Is it so that we can't find anybody? How about Handsome Newsom in California? Yeah, I, I was gonna ask you, okay, who are the exciting candidates that we could be mining? Um, as I was doing some, just looking around for, on relevant topics, I did see that Gavin Newsom's name has been thrown out there and he claims he's not running this time. Um, who, who else is there? Pete Buttigieg? I mean, he's very appealing. I suppose he could be um, polarizing the sense that there, you know, there are people who are very strongly still against LGBT rights. Um, I was intrigued to read an article today on Washington Post about Kamala Harris and Nikki Haley attacking her. And I just thought, how ridiculous is that? Um, well, first of all, I mean, it's just really sad that an Indian American Republican candidate feels that her, her best way of making an impact is to attack another Indian American uh, person on the other side. I mean, what what's the ultimate of self-hate in terms of gender and race than that? And what advantage can the Democrats take of that? Um, you know, just send, again, send the positive message, um, hone um, Kamala's message and image. Um, I, you know, I think she is, does suffer from the lack of, seems like public um, popularity and having that, uh, having that charisma. So I, I think we're still searching. I'm, I'm hoping that she can rise to the occasion. Well, I wonder about that. You know, Joe Biden really didn't give her much of a spotlight, hasn't given her much of the spotlight. At first, I thought that was really unfair, that you have to treat your vice president better. Um, but then I concluded that he hasn't given her much of the spotlight for a reason. Uh, she, <laughs> I don't think she's actually a winner by herself. Um, and and I, I think she's a kind of impediment somehow. She's she's a necessary candidate on that ticket, but she's an impediment to his winning. So, you know, what happens is you talked about the media, Louise. Um, and I and I watch the media. I'm, I'm magnetized on the media. I want to hear what they have to say. But here's the thing. When Trump or his acolytes um, criticize Biden and do bananas things, I want a candidate, a Democratic candidate, to stand up there and let him have it. He doesn't do that. 
He doesn't let him have it. He doesn't, you know, uh, evoke your your passion. Um, and who does evoke your passion? Uh, MSNBC, to a lesser extent, CNN. Um, and I say, well, this is is this the right role for the media to be standing where Biden should be standing? It's simply not as effective. They're not in office. They weren't elected. They, they don't, you know, they're, they're not in the center of the ring. He is. Somebody should be letting them have it. But nobody does. Um, do, you, do you think that's missing here? Or maybe it's the more gentlemanly thing not to let them have it. You know, Please. that's an interesting question. Um, I, I I agree with you. Part of me wants to just, you know, say it like it is. And on the other hand, if you react that way, are you just giving voice to ridiculous um, attacks? And are you giving them air, more airtime than they deserve? Um, yeah, you know, I'm up. I'm not I'm not a communications expert, so I don't know. But part of me just wants that, you know, the Democrats to tell them off and and just point out how just misled the Republicans are and how much let's just, you know, focus on what the Democratic Party has done for the for America. And I'm not hearing that message come across very clearly. Yeah. Well, Chuck, you know, here's a question for you. Suppose Joe Biden or someone else in his stead were to take the floor on this and respond to Trump and respond to all the outrageous things the Republicans have been doing and will continue to do, you know, trying to impeach Biden. I mean, really, give me a break. Um, suppose the, the Democrats do that. Joe Biden or his successor does that. And they answer him point for point. They let him have it. How is that going to work? with the base, with the people who are at the fringe of the base, and with the Democrats. Is it a successful, you know, strategy? I think that's a great question, and it really depends on the way you do it. Maybe the coalescing point for Democrats really standing up for something that matters is to make accountability a principal part of their platform then we're the party that is going to hold people accountable. <clears throat> and that includes transgressions even on their own side. There have been Democrats that have been, and Hunter Biden and others. But if accountability is made a major point, you don't have to go through the point by point rebuttal because it just gives their talking points more time, more emphasis. If you focus on accountability, say, look, here's the issue. <clears throat> An attack upon the U.S. Capitol. We all saw it. We all heard it. We all know that it was intended to stop the process to confirm the presidential wow. election results that the people of this country voted for. Our administration our party stands for accountability. If you break the law, if you attack democracy in ways that do that, we're going to hold you accountable. You know, Louise, one thing I think people do not understand is what life would be like in a in a country led by Republicans of this ilk. I, I think that they, they believe that they can go on with their lives just as before. And they don't see how all of these threads we've been watching, evaluating, you know, including trying to uh, change the result of an election, how that will affect mm, the country and our daily lives. I'm talking about civil liberties. I'm talking about freedom of expression. I'm talking about fairness in the courts and fairness in the agencies, not um, using the FBI as a weapon or using the IRS as a weapon. That's in the cards. You know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that the Republicans will change your life. And I don't think that, that, that Joe Biden has made that clear. 
Do you think that would be helpful? I think it would be. I think somebody should make a movie. <laughs> <laughs> they should make a TV series. That's the way, you know, that's how people are getting their news and information. Um, I also think it's important to sort of work behind the scenes, quietly work behind the scenes. And I think that's being done, um, you know, going, making sure we do get out the vote and we do get out the youth vote and all. Of course, with that comes the necessity of having a message. Um, but I think that, you know, we need to be able to pull together the eye if they're not already seeing it the fact that we you know in our in a year or two we've already seen how civil liberties have eroded because of the supreme court decisions on choice and the like um yeah i, I think that that's a good point to focus on uh, the other point that i really was brought home to me about the danger of trump is that i was just in berlin this summer and going to a lot of the museums and they have uh, you know the uh, Germans have done been very reflective on how where they went wrong and how Nazism took hold. But it very very interesting to me was the fact that they talked about how one of Hitler's strategies or his his cohort was to um, concentrate power in the executive branch and in the executive. And right at that time, there was a news item that came out about Trump and his cronies plotting to you know put all the power in the president's office. Um, and I just thought, geez, we can't let that happen. And people, you know, we need to keep telling that story. You know, NPR and other news outlets do tell stories about what has happened um, because of the state restrictions on abortion to, you know, how that has resulted in real harm to women. And uh, yeah, I think we need more stories on that. And as I said, maybe a movie. Mm, that's a great idea. You know, Chuck. You know, we. Uh, I think we've we've uh, identified something is that you can't do it the way we were doing it before. You can't write a long, boring platform. Um, you can't be a, a Fauntleroy and expressing it. Um, you know that you have to have passion, and um, you have to offer people, uh, you know, a better life. Uh, the things that they really care about at home. And uh, one of the things uh, that, that has come up in the past 10 years, maybe five, is that social media really has a huge effect on public opinion and a huge effect on voting results. And we know that uh, Vladimir Putin, through his internet research agency in Moscow, which was run by Prigozhin, by the way, years past, um, you know, is, is on our shores. And it's very easy for him to send disruptive social media all over the country, which he has done in two elections and which he will do again. And so social media is, is really everything. Are the Democrats using social media in the same way, in sufficient ways to counteract what uh, Trump and Putin are doing for this election? No, not at all. I'll give you a couple of examples. There are really important, true, valuable stories that Democrats are not sharing on either print or video or social media. For example, there are thousands of people who are assigned the jobs of dealing with our hardest and most damaging and harmful problems the environment, climate change, <clears throat> drugs, opioids, gun violence, others. And the Republicans are talking about dismantling those groups who are and have been for decades our only protection, maybe not the most effective, but our only protection against the pervasion of those problems. And we can look at the source of those problems from the people that it profits the most. You know, tell the story like it is. Yeah. There are, there are power and wealth villains out there, and there are groups and organizations and agencies that are poorly equipped, but that at least the Democratic Party has tried to equip and support to try and deal with, mitigate, and improve those problem areas. Whereas on the other side of it, the Republicans are talking about coming in, 
No, we don't want any of those controls out there. If you just leave it to private business, everything will be fine. The climate, the gun violence, the drugs, education, clearly not true. Talk about the broken models and talk about the people that it's going to take to rebuild and enforce better models. Yeah, we are in an emergency. <clears throat> We're in a constitutional emergency for my money. And, and I, I would like um, Joe Biden or his successor um, to get up there and, and, and paint it that way. You know, for example, I did look at the, um, the, the platform of the National Democratic Party, and um, they didn't get to foreign policy until the last paragraph. And in the last paragraph, in the last part of the last paragraph, there was one mention, the only mention in this entire lengthy platform of Ukraine. And it was completely limp, limp. If you read it, you'll see. And I'm saying to myself, this is a critical part of Biden's platform. Why doesn't he say something? Why doesn't the Democratic Party say something? This is so critical. And, he, you know, they're, they're all being so timid about it. And they feel maybe they're going to lose votes if they actually push, you know, support for Ukraine. That's crazy. they got to say what they really want. they got to say what they really think is best for the country. And this kind of timidity is a killer. They're going to lose if they do that. What do you think, Louise? Um, you're absolutely right, Jay. And how do we get this message to the people who are, fo are focusing the message? Chris Dennis Jung. <laughs> <laughs> On this, I would really have loved to hear his thoughts and how we can move the dial um, locally and, and importantly, nationally. It's a conversation we need to keep to have continue. Well, on that note, um, I want to ask you about, I uh, forgot who the, uh, the House Speaker once said that uh, all politics is local, you know, and um, <clears throat> I, I have come to question that. Uh, I think all politics are national, and uh, I, get, I get 500 emails every day telling me to um, you know, contribute to a campaign on the mainland. Uh, and frankly, those campaigns at the end of the day are going to have a lot more to do with the future of the country and the world and me uh, than the campaigns here in Hawaii. Sorry, that's the way I feel about it. Um, so now uh, all politics is national and you can't say that all politics are local anymore, which means that if you are a patriot, if you care, about the future of the country and all of us, then you participate in the national process. And if you don't like the democratic campaign or the way of campaigning, then you, here in Hawaii or anywhere, um, you get up there and make us think about it. Do you agree with that? Um, yes. <laughs> I don't know if you're asking Chuck or me. I, I mean, I, I think both. I mean, local is important because that's hitting us every day of our lives. But you are right that uh, we can't ignore the national scene either. Um, maybe what made it bearable for us in during the Trump years was the fact that Hawaii is blue, is, you know, socially liberal, but that doesn't protect the rest of the country um, from just the injustices that we we saw during that time. So we can't ignore national and we do need to pay attention and we do need to vote and we need to make sure we get our youth to vote as well. Yeah, I know one family, it's very romantic. Uh, they're active in the, the Hawaii Democratic Party and every, every campaign, they go to the mainland together and they walk house to house in various wow. states and talk to people about what the Democrats are doing and what the Republicans are doing. Now, we can't afford to do that, but we can do other things short of that. So, Chuck, we're about out of time, and I want to offer you uh, a chance to summarize and also to say to us, what can we do about this, if anything? Or are we past the inflection point now? Is Joe Biden going to be the candidate, and is it going to be lackluster? Great question. 
you know what I would love to see is for the Democrats and the media to put out there the stories of people who are fighting to preserve the values, the relationships, the institutions that mean the most to us in our daily lives. People who are out there doing things to try and protect the environment, to try and reduce gun violence, to try and protect teachers' ability to be able to conduct critical thinking and learning to be able to get health care to people who have long been excluded and underserved. Those are the stories that I think, to me, can make the difference to real people. Because ultimately, you're going to have to count votes. And Republicans are doing everything they can to make sure that that's going to be as difficult for the people they see as the other, the enemy, as possible. Tell the stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for that, you have to have rhetoric. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw uh, Vladimir uh, Zelensky's comments to the United Nations yesterday, but he was fabulous. And he told the story. He provided the narrative. He gave you the way it was on the ground. He, he made you care. And I thought that's true leadership. It's not just leadership of Ukraine. It's global leadership. And um, I'm, I'm not saying he could do better than Handsome Newsom, but he he and what he stands for and the way he speaks, the way he um, fashions the narrative uh, is what we need here on the part of the Democratic Party. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying he should run for president, though. I, well, maybe I am. Anyway, Louise, what do you think? Well, what are your final I, I comments think, here? Yeah, I think we need passion. I also think whether Joe Biden runs or not, we need to develop successors. You know, that's always a mantra on with private companies and boards that you need to develop your successors to have a strong organization. We need to do that politically. I mean, we're seeing it at both parties where, um, you know, leadership is aging and you get the sense that they're not building up the next generation. And we really need to do that. Yeah, it's part of a sort of a national fatigue, isn't it? You know, if we hear the press drone on about this every day and, and you know, you can almost predict what's going to happen. You can almost predict what they're going to say. It, it, gets to, it gets to suck all the oxygen out on both sides and people get tired of it. And when they get tired of it, they kind of make an assumption that they can't do anything about it. It's, it's complacency come current. And we can't afford to have that, can we? Thank you so much, Louise. Louise Ng. Thank uh, you. Chuck Crumpton, great, great discussion. Aloha. Mm -hmm.